Hello, this is the Darkness Underneath podcast and Quentin Walker. If you have already heard this, or if you're not interested in hearing this, the show begins in two minutes. First, I'd like to say that thanks to Irish Lux Channel, I have new information from Pete LaFrosca. All my stories will be condensed, and I would like you very much to go to his channel, Irish Luck, to hear the broader stories and some side stories. Irish Luck deserves the attention for that, so I'm promoting it. No, I'm not being paid for anything in these pre-talks. Next, Felon Magazine is going to be soliciting my podcast in its magazine, and I in turn want to solicit Felon Magazine here. It's a great magazine. Neither of us are being paid. I am friends with the guy who owns the magazine. Don't endorse any politics, either right or left, on this channel unless I say something specific. However, it's a great magazine, and Deskovic, the guy that I assist with, is on the cover of the next one that's coming out. Finally, if you would like to get updates for when I'm coming out, I'll always be releasing on either Sundays or Wednesdays from when I finished, so you're not checking every day. You can go to The Life Mafia Mobsters Gangsters and Organized Crime on Facebook. It releases new episodes of Roy DeMeo and Murder Machine when they come out, or episodes related to other people in charge of gangs. And for general content, since this doesn't just cover Mafia stuff, I do other series. You can go to my page, The Darkness Underneath, on Facebook. And that's all I have to say, for now. Let's begin the show. Hello, this is the Darkness Underneath podcast, and this is episode 6 of Roy DeMeo and Murder Machine. And it's titled, Lost Beneath Ambition. Who was Roy DeMeo? Was he really loyal to the Gambino family? Or was it more about his ambitions? Was he just another mobster? Didn't miss his children's party. He's dealing with ruthless maniacs. Maybe more ruthless than most. Or was he something far worse? Roy's crew would kill you for any reason. Was he a psychopath? Someone so depraved through complex neurological abnormalities that they struggle with empathy and might not care about others at all? Didn't miss Sunday dinner? They were the most feared crew. He was, he always encouraged his children. It's easy to show love when there isn't anything to lose. Like the cult leader Jim Jones, did Roy care more about respect and power than he did anybody else? Did whatever dark ambitions that fueled him to murder and destroy and work so hard also prevent him from walking away from power, from the status and respect once it began to collapse all around him. Even if not walking away meant that he would probably die. The group could have killed uh, as many as 200 people. For that matter, are most mobsters psychopaths? Are some psychopaths worse than others? Knowing someone can be really difficult, especially when they're dead. 
Who were you, Roy? During the summer of 1976, Roy was excited. His dream was on the cusp of fruition. He'd helped Nino take down two men in revenge for attacking him personally, impressing the boss. And he'd gotten revenge on Burkini, showing he had the balls to take down a made man to his own crew. But best of all, in recent years, the commission had opened the books, and even though the godfather of the Gambitas himself wasn't making new made men, Carlos's health was disintegrating, and whatever power kept that dilapidated, scrawny body moving was obviously about to give out. Furthermore, Nino assured Roy that Paul, the captain of the Brooklyn faction, was going to become the new boss, even though Della Croce was the underboss. Most of his life, Roy had wanted to be a real mafioso, a made man, even back when he didn't know what they were called. He'd first started working for the Mafia at the Banner Dairy in the 50s, when it had been owned by a mobster or somebody connected. And from there, he had worked hard to become an associate, a position he'd now stayed stagnant at for many years. But Roy had managed to keep his faith strong, gambling on the Gambinos, even when he was offered to be a made man under the Lucchese. Roy had been boasting to his crew now for years he'd be a Gambino one day, and the crew would be the most powerful. He saw no reason why Paul would turn him down now with all the money and muscle he brought to the table. This was only going to make him look more incredible in the eyes of his minions once he became made. The boys believed that Roy could do anything, and Roy was keen on giving him a reason to believe that. He was, after all, one of the biggest earners among the Gambino associates. He was also building the toughest crew. Sure, he wasn't quite where he wanted to be just yet, but he'd get there. Pete LaFrosca, one of his best car thieves, was still only a part-timer. Roy had been trying to get Pete to work for him full-time for many years now, but he was only showing signs he'd be open to the possibility recently. He was still, at this point, working with John Quinn. In the meantime, Roy had a new member, one who was going to be very useful, Danny Grillo. Grillo seemed like a nice guy. He even managed to keep his boyish features, despite being in his 40s. But beneath his all shucks look and party-loving charm was a very dangerous man. Grillo could coolly manipulate people into ambushes and spread their brains across the ground with a pistol without a second thought. He'd kill just about anybody if he wasn't close to him, and if it was to his advantage, of course. Although it was ironic he was so greedy because he'd often then just piss it away on coke and gambling. Thank fuck those were problems that Roy didn't have, he felt. He didn't like anything that controlled him too much. His drugs were money and murder. Not some stupid substance. Or random chance. At least not that kind of random chance. Besides murder, Grillo's other specialty was hijacking, something he'd been serving time in prison for and only recently finished his sentence. Danny Grillo was exactly the kind of killer Roy was looking to add to the rest of his merry homicidal band of degenerates. Now, in the book The Westies by T.J. English, T.J. identifies Grillo as a Gambino soldier and Roy as an up-and-coming capo. But that's actually incorrect. Roy wasn't even a soldier yet, and he sure as hell wasn't up-and-coming since Paul had told Nino he didn't want to ever make Roy as a made man. Something Roy didn't know yet. And as for Grillo, well, he was working for Roy, so that meant that he was just another associate. To be fair to TJ, the Mafia itself wasn't his focus, but that is incorrect if you read that in the Westies. Now, even though in 1976-77 to 77, Grillo was new to Roy's crew, he wasn't new to Roy. They had worked together the first time back in the Canarsie junkyard days, during the mid-60s. It was actually a coincidence that Grillo and Pete came into the DeMeo fold in 76, because Grillo met Pete at the same time DeMeo did, back in the 60s. And the story I'm about to tell you, I learned from Pete himself on Irish Lux Channel. You can find the links below, and I'd like you to check them out. I'm going to give you a condensed version. You can hear the broader version there. And he deserves the clicks and the credit for me hearing this story. So back in the 60s, some cop had pulled over Grillo's nephew. And a girl who he had been driving a stolen car he had tagged from Pete and Chris Rosenberg. You see, Pete and Chris Rosenberg were friends in their teens. 
and stole cars together that far back. So, Grillo's nephew, I don't know his name, it's not important, hadn't had much of a spine, and he snitched on Pete and Chris. Now, I'm going to call Grillo's nephew just nephew to avoid mixing him up with Grillo. And I also don't want to keep saying Grillo's nephew because it's a little wordy and tedious and distracting. After nephew snitched to this uh, cop, that cop by chance, it was probably John Doherty, was working for DeMeo, who had told him to be on the lookout for new car talent. So the cop told Roy DeMeo about these taggers after uh, nephew snitched. And one of those taggers was Chris. Now, whether Roy met Chris at the gas station first, or whether he then told him to meet at the gas station, because I do believe the story that DeMeo met Chris at a gas station. I don't know if that was prior or afterwards. That's a little bit of a discrepancy between Dominic's story and Pete's. But in any event, Roy knew who Chris was, or learned who Chris was. And in the meantime, Pete, well, he had a spy among them too, oddly enough. He knew the girl that was with Nephew. And so that girl told Pete about the cop and Grillo's nephew snitching on him. But Pete still didn't know that the cop was a rogue. I hope this isn't getting too confusing. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. And he still didn't know about Roy and Grillo's involvement. So, a couple days later, Pete's sitting at home babysitting his two-year-old kid with his cousin, a big country fellow, in Pete's words. About as country as an Italian with ties to Brooklyn could get, anyway. And that's when the phone rang. And Pete, he picks up the phone, and he says, Hello? Hey, I want you to come down to the Gemini Lounge, a man said, without identifying himself. Pete paused, confused. What the hell? Who the hell is this guy, and how'd he get my number, he thought. Who is this? This is Roy. And? You gotta come down to the Gemini. I want to talk to you. Hey, I don't know you, and besides, I'm watching my daughter. Pete then hung up, probably feeling queer like this was the episode of a Twilight Zone or something. If some stranger suddenly call him like that. The phone immediately rang again, notifying him that whoever the net was on the other side was going to continue to be persistent. Yeah? Are you going to come down here? Hey, I said I don't know you. Then Pete hangs up again, probably thinking, who the fuck is this nut? Ten minutes go by, a Cadillac pulls up. So For some reason, back then, everybody loved driving Cadillacs among DeMeo's crew. Even Nino had his fancy Cadillac. So, two intimidating guys get out. Danny Grillo and Roy DeMeo. Grillo is the one who starts doing the talking. This time, he's a little older than Roy, and they're probably equals. Roy doesn't have a crew yet. This is the 60s. And Roy was in his mid-20s at this time. So... Pete goes outside, you know, he's in his teens, and Grillo begins to explain what happened. Of course, he doesn't know that Pete already knows what happened. As Grillo's talking, Pete can tell both of them are more than just street guys, like these are serious guys, obviously connected. They seem very informed, very on the go, they have their shit together. And so as he's talking, Grillo, LaFrosca says... Wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm not the smartest tool in the shed, but you guys, aren't you guys the guys who don't believe in people snitching? They nod. One of them says, definitely. S so what the fuck is this about? What are you talking about? One of them, probably Roy at this point, says. Look, I, I don't mean no disrespect, nothing else, but this is what went down. That kid got pulled over and busted for narcot nar narcotics, and, and that nephew of yours, uh, now I wasn't there. He held up his hand at Grillo. I wasn't there, he said diplomatically, but I was told by a bird that was right there that he told the cops all about the cars. So therefore, in my mind, that nephew of yours, that nephew is a snitch. 
At this point, Pete still doesn't entirely know what's going on. Brillo becomes furious and charges forward, and Roy follows. Now, LaFrosca's a little guy and not the scrappiest. He swung back and uh, got a few hits in, but Grillo begins to beat the crap out of him. That's when that country cousin comes out, storming out, and fires a warning shot with a shotgun. Hey, don't hit my cousin again, he says coldly. Roy glanced over at the cousin and held up his hands, palm upward, in a calm down gesture. He didn't seem afraid, but he had a mission here, and didn't fancy eating buckshot that day. Roy then began to explain what they wanted. But Pete still refused. He was making enough money on his own, wasn't interested in losing to a middle guy who didn't have much to offer him at that point, and Roy looked chagrined, probably a little angry, but left with Grillo. Pete wasn't happy that Chris snitched now and told him who he was, but they made up and Chris told him to avoid the Gemini Lounge at that point because Roy was angry at him, and so Pete avoided the place like it was filled with the plague for his own good. Eventually, as Roy's reputation grew, Pete started considering how it might be beneficial working for him. At that point, even though Roy wasn't angry at Pete anymore, Chris continued to tell Pete that he was angry at him because Pete was a better car thief than Chris, and Chris was afraid that he might lose Roy's esteem to Pete. It would be years before Roy hunted Pete down again and talked to him, and that's when Pete agreed to work for Roy, closer to 76. That's all I'm going to say about Pete for now. Now, in between the event with Pete and Grillo, Grillo had gone to prison for years after being arrested for one of his specialties, hijacking, and he hadn't been a member of the DeMeo crew until now. He had recently gotten out of prison, worked with the Westies, who I'm going to talk about in a little bit, and now he's with DeMeo. When he first started working for DeMeo, he met Dominic, and they hit it off. Dominic's pretty easy to get along with, I suspect. And during this period, Grillo and DeMeo hijacked a shipment of Smith & Wesson handguns from a truck at JFK Airport. These guns have been headed for Finland from the U.S. and been intended for the Finnish Police Department. So they went to Dominic, who agreed to hide them for some money, because he needed extra money, Nina wasn't paying him much, at his house. Then his wife, Denise, had conniptions about it. She was upset. She didn't want all these guns here. This is something she could get in big trouble for, and her husband, and demanded Dominic remove them. You can't leave them here! You've got to get them out! She cried. And quite frankly, who the fuck can blame her? Who wants an arsenal in their apartment that is supposed to belong to the cops? You're going to spend the next 20 years in prison. Dominic told Grillo, Look, I can't sit here with an armory in my house. Denise will be nutty until they're not out of here. So Grillo and DeMeo come over and they get the guns. And they take them somewhere else. I suspect they took them to the Gemini basement. That's where Roy usually took his weapons. They say you can still see bullet holes down there, whatever they were doing. Probably killing, probably killing people and practicing. Anyway, Roy allowed Dominic to keep one of these fancy-looking guns as a bonus for his effort. A little flashy blue gun. Ain't they beautiful? Roy would stare at the guns like they were lovers, marveling. Now, it was during this period Dominic was probably as close and on good terms as he would ever get with Roy. And he'd confide in him on occasion, telling Nino... Telling him about Nino and that Nino wasn't paying him enough for his wife and kid, or giving him enough responsibility to make him happy. And Roy, who was a complex man, and not always Freddy Krueger, would sympathize and offer him easy work and good pay. It's interesting enough, actually, that in the far future, Roy would try to talk Nino out of killing Dominic. But that's a story for another day. An interesting story that did happen during this period between the two. One day, Dominic was at the Gemini telling Roy about his problems, and Roy suggested, Why don't you just do what I do? Go borrow money off a loan shark and kill him the next day. Not my style, Roy. You won't have to pay him back. It's a way to get a nest egg. It was at that moment Dominic grinned and said, 
Okay, Roy, loan me a hundred grand. Dominic patted Roy on the shoulder to let him know he was joking. Suddenly, the friendliness drained from Roy's eyes and they hardened into a menacing, lifeless glare. Murderous shark eyes. And Dominic felt anxious and wished he hadn't made that joke. Roy had taken it either as a real threat or disrespectful. And Roy really was crazy, he realized, underneath that, underneath his gregarious charm. So, in addition to part-time Pete and his old colleague in crime, Grillo, another guy had joined the DeMeo crew, Matt Rega. So, Matt Rega was a scumbag extraordinaire, though not among these guys. Among DeMeo's plethora of degenerates, Rega was almost respectable by comparison. Imagine an Italian dressed in heavy gold necklaces, wearing pricey rings, driving around in a 1970s Porsche or Cadillac, had the title of sleazy car salesman, does a lot of coke, wears 1970s fancy clothes, and you get an image of what Rega was like. Rega joined the crew after owing Chris and Roy a lot of money. When somebody owed Roy a lot of money and couldn't always pay it back, he didn't automatically hurt you. That'd be a waste of money. Instead, Roy, consider how you might be useful to him. Useful enough to earn even more money than the cost it had been to loan you the money in the first place. So, Rega was the principal owner of a Bronx firm called Team Auto Wholesalers in the Bronx. And he also owned a used car auto dealership in New Jersey. He was now part of the crew, his efforts, or rather for Roy's efforts... And he was selling stolen cars for Roy, Chris, and Nino. And this arrangement also helped Rega because he had a terrible cocaine addiction, aside from spending a lot of money on cars and jewelry and clothes. And that cocaine addiction was costing him a lot of money. And you really can assume that if they were in Roy's crew, unless it was Roy or Nino who abstained, they had a coke addiction. But Rega was particularly bad about snorting coke too much. Now, Rega's dad was a bookmaker from another mafia family. I don't know anything else about his pops at this point. And there's not too much more that you need to know about Rega right now. One day, Dominic arrived at Rega's auto dealership and began having a friendly conversation with Rega. Rega said irritably, I don't like borrowing money from Roy anymore because Chris is too pushy. He always has an attitude and he's always in a hurry. You have to stop what you're doing to handle him. Dominic sympathized. Chris has a Napoleonic complex. He's always trying to prove how tough he is. But like I once told my friend Henry Brelly, Chris will dig his own grave someday. Dominic became even friendlier with Rega after that, since he picked up loans Rega had taken from Nino now, too. But Dominic didn't know it. However, Rega told Chris what Dominic said about him behind his back, even though Rega was the first person to start ridiculing Chris while he wasn't present. So either Rega's mouth must have gotten away from him, or else he was two-faced and manipulative. He says I'm always trying to prove how tough I am, Chris fumed. Yeah, well, any time he wants, I'm ready. All his green braid bullshit doesn't scare me. Roy told Chris to keep his mouth shut. He didn't need issues with Chris and Nino's nephew. And that's probably a good thing for Chris, that he didn't try to pick a fight with Dominic. I doubt Chris had any training in anything other than shooting and talking tough, and I'm pretty sure Dominic would have thrown his tiny little ass through a window. Not just because he's tiny, but I also don't think he knew how to fight. At least from the evidence. Either way, Dominic continued to get along with Rega, because he didn't realize what a big mouth he had. And he got along well with Grillo, sharing drinks, and they did a lot of drugs together, all three of them. Then, during the fall of 1976, Carlo Gambino died peacefully at his Massapequa home where he had lived part-time when he wasn't staying at his Brooklyn home. He had been the boss of their family since 1957 when he had helped orchestrate the assassination of a previous boss, one as ruthless and bloodthirsty as Roy himself, Albert Anastasia. Carlo Gambino really was as close to an old-school, polite gangster stereotype like out of Godfather as there ever was. It could even be hard to believe he'd been a crook other than the bodyguards around him. Not that any of this mattered to Roy. When he learned the news, he was excited. And honestly, he should have been. He didn't know Gambino personally, had no reason to care about him. 
You talked about him out of respect because he was a man of power. That's what you were supposed to do if you wanted to be in the mob. But by then, he was as eager as ever for his button. However, in reality, the succession for Paul wasn't that simple. Della Croce was getting out of prison, and he was the underboss. Usually, the underboss was the guy who became the boss, since he was second in command. And that was a problem. The Gambinos weren't like other mob families, and Carlos had decided to pick Castellano, the leader of the Brooklyn faction. Frankly, I think that was Carlo's biggest mistake as a mafia boss. Choosing Paul. Because I think Della Croce was a far smarter and more efficient mob boss, at least smarter in that field. He had less prejudices, and he was more capable. Della Croce also seemed less bloodthirsty. Paul was actually more bloodthirsty than Gotti in many ways. So before I continue with the story, what's the difference between the Brooklyn faction? And the Manhattan faction? No, it doesn't mean that all of them were in Manhattan, all of them were in Brooklyn. Usually the Brooklyn faction were based in Brooklyn, but the Manhattan faction could also be in Queens and other places. The Gaudis were actually located in Queens. The reason why they call them the Manhattan and the Brooklyn faction is because when Carlo, Carlo Gambino appointed an underboss from Manhattan and created a Manhattan faction, and his guys, who were also Castellano's guys, were largely located in Brooklyn. Carlos really had been smarter and wiser at running his crime family than any boss prior to him, and any boss that would succeed. That includes Paul Castellano and John Gotti. I would even go so far as to say that every boss after Carlo would continually become more and more incompetent at running the crime family. Paul made a lot of stupid mistakes. John made even more stupid mistakes. Gotti's son should never even have been in the Mafia. And Pete Gotti was a complete fucking idiot. And no, I'm not just saying that because Sammy the Bull said that. Pete Gotti, for those who lived in New York City, made a spectacle of himself in the papers and was nicknamed the Dumbest Dong by journalist. Considering John knew he was a rube, so I wonder he ever made him a Don in the first place or that their underlings ever agreed to it. So, anyway, back to the story. Carlos Gambinos really was the last great Gambino godfather. I say great in terms of effectively managing this criminal organization. I don't think the Mafia are good or great, but he competently ran the organization. And I'm going to point out the mistakes that Paul made as he enters my story more and more, including with Roy. So, with Carlos's death, the Gambinos were facing a potential civil war. On top of that, Castellano had something going against him as the new boss, if he was to become one, and that's that he was facing loan sharking charges and might go to prison. The witness was his own nephew. Also, the powerful Gotti crew supported Della Croce, and they were ready to go to war for him. While Paul didn't have any tough crews except for Nino Gaggi's DeMeo crew, and DeMeo wasn't even a made man. And although Roy didn't know this yet, Paul didn't actually plan on making DeMeo a made man. For three reasons. One, Paul was a bigot and only wanted to make Sicilians made men. As a Neapolitan, as you might recall, he considered DeMeo to be inferior as a choice. He considered them unpredictable as it was. Two, he thought there was something psychologically wrong with Roy, and that was also a reason why he was unpredictable. He also considered him a brown noser and didn't like him. A reputation that always followed Roy, a brown noser, his whole life. Additionally, Paul looked down on street guys like Roy, and Gotti for that matter, thinking that the Mafia should adopt a more white-collar approach, which is why that Gambino had chosen him, because Gambino also wanted to become more white-collar. It's almost like these guys wanted to go legitimate or something. So a huge funeral was held for Carlos, with his family and friends attending during the day, and his criminal associates going to the wake at night. Roy had his crew dress up, but since they lacked any status, they sat in the back. Nino and Dominic got to sit close to the front. Then, after the funeral, Paul was acquitted on Thanksgiving Day, when his nephew, a key witness again, suddenly forgot everything, and Della Croce was finally released from prison a few days later. So now the confrontation would begin. If Della Croce violently contested Gambino's choice of Paul for leadership, then there was going to be a civil war between the two factions. 
And John Gotti himself had just been released. So that would have made it particularly advantageous for Della Croce. Gotti was easily the smartest among his mentally defective crew, especially with Gene Gotti and Ruggiero as members. Those two guys made DeMeo's men almost look like Heisenberg and Turing by comparison. Still, they were good muscle, and bristling for a fight. A meeting was held between the two factions at Nino's bunker, between Della Croce and his guys, and Nino and Paul. Dominic borrowed an M2 automatic from Roy, and was told by Nino to fire on anybody leaving if you hear gunshots. That would mean that both Nino and Paul were dead. Fortunately, the meeting went well, and Della Croce, who seemed reasonable, again, in order to avoid violence, agreed to remain underboss and allow Paul to take over. Della Croce was always looking at what was best for his family and not just what was best for himself. Once Paul became boss, he immediately began making decrees. One demand was that the Capos now have to kick up 15% of their earnings instead of the typical 10% they usually had to pay. This was a greedy, colossal mistake. But Paul was known to be extremely greedy and stingy, traits that neither John Gotti or Roy himself were nearly as bad about. And although he didn't make any new-made men right away, Nino was immediately promoted to captain, or capo as I prefer to call them. Nino was also given command of Paul's old crew, a crew of mostly soft guys who preferred to do construction bid rigging and backdoor deals in poultry business instead of anything on the street. Roy was also shocked and distraught to find that Paul had no intention of ever making him a made man. I want to be made! I fucking deserve it! Roy complained. I'll speak to Paul. Just relax, Nino said. But then Nino also admitted to Roy that he didn't really want him to become made either, and he also told him, You don't have to get promoted now. You're doing fine. If you get promoted, Paul's not going to stand for half the shit you're getting away with, and you're going to end up getting hurt. The stuff that Nino was talking about was child pornography and drugs. And although I don't, the more I think about it, think that Roy approved of child pornography or ever looked at it himself, since he never hurt his kids or any other kids, at least there were no complaints of him ever hurting any kids, and I don't think he probably did. I do think that. He would do anything at this point to make money and get his button. Roy was persistent, and he wanted to be made, and he was going to do anything he could to become made. Roy was determined to be made. It was his obsession, an obsession which he would sell his soul for. Power made life worth living for Roy. He wouldn't let this pretentious asshole Castellano stop him. Roy would sneer to his son Albert about that uppity prick living in his big, fancy mansion. And it was Grillo, of all people, who brought Roy opportunity, even though Grillo wasn't imaginative enough to see it. During the 1970s, a turf war was raging in the west side part of Manhattan, known as Hell's Kitchen. The Irish mobster, Mickey Spillaney, was trying to exterminate a young upstart named Jimmy Coonan. Now, Coonan was a sociopathic thug who enjoyed dismembering people almost as much as Roy did, and then deflating their bodies and tossing them into the river. When Grillo told Roy about this ruthless young killer, Coonan, he didn't expect it to mean much. But Roy, well, he saw a chance to make his dream finally happen. This Coonan was going to make him a made man in no time, and bring more killers underneath his command. And Roy was correct, it would. It would also lead to a Faustian pact between Roy and Paul, that would intertwine their fates, and for which they both would dearly regret someday. <laughs>